Asheville, North Carolina, after the aftermath of Hurricane Helene, which is said to have completely destroyed uh, the town of Asheville. And it's been record. Uh, I mean, it was a record storm. A lot of the town was underwater. Communication was cut off. Electricity was cut off. Roads were completely destroyed. Bridges were completely destroyed, cutting people off from any type of assistance, any type of help. Uh, rivers were at record levels, very high, you know, flooding buildings and all of that. And there is great loss and over a thousand calls of missing people. Now, what's very interesting, what got my attention about Asheville and many other places is that there's been a story about sundown towns being destroyed in the hurricane. The hurricane hit these places. And so I, I did a little research and you'll be surprised or maybe you won't be surprised about whether or not Asheville was a sundown town or not. But we'll go into some history of Asheville, North Carolina. This is Mountain Express. This, this website is Mountain Express, Asheville, North Carolina. This article reads Asheville Archives, White Supremacy Made Permanent in the 1900s. So I'm going to read some of it. Y'all just rock with me. It says African American men first exercised their right to vote in the eight in the 1868 election. By 1870, this right was adopted into the U.S. Constitution under the 15th of Amendment. Tension surrounding its passage continued throughout the final three decades of the 19th century, often resulting in violence and death. By 1898. Now, y'all know that when it came to voting, uh, uh, black people, when they would go to the polls, they would be uh, threatened. They would be coerced on who to vote or they could uh, be put to death at the hands of angry mobs. OK, for just for voting. By 1898, the Democrats, who at the time identified as conservatives, began a white supremacy campaign. In 1900, North Carolina was set to vote on an amendment to its state constitution. Liter literacy tests were among the additions proposed. Illiterate white men, however, didn't have to worry. This point was made clear in a January 30, 1900 Q&A in the Asheville Daily Citizen paper titled White Supremacy made permanent. The piece answered inquiries and concerns surrounding the amendment. Would, for example, uneducated white men have to pass a literacy, literacy test in order to cast a ballot? The paper answered, certainly not. Under it, any white man who could vote at any time before 1867 or whose ancestors that, that is, his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather could vote at any time before 1867, can register, whether he can read and write or not. So, North Carolina came with a proposed amendment for a literacy test. So, this was proposed so that Black folks could not vote because most black folks were illiterate. So if you was illiterate, you would not be able to vote. But when the question was posed, whether or not white men who were illiterate could, could uh, vote, it said, no, they, they could still vote. This is not going to stop them. Now, listen to this. It says, the follow-up question asks, why this difference between the white man and the Negro? The paper responded, why bless your soul, it is a matter of natural understanding and capacity. The white man has more sense and capacity than the Negro and by nature understands the duties and responsibilities of suffrage and citizenship better than the Negro. And the Democratic Party holds that the uneducated white man can be trusted to cast a more intelligent vote than even an educated Negro. Ain't that something? Let me put a picture up. I'm going to keep reading the article. This is the actual picture from the article that I'm going to put up while I read the article, okay? 
This is an actual picture from North Carolina, from uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Now it said. Now I'm gonna go on into the uh, go on into a little more. It says the vote for the amendment would not take place until August second, nineteen hundred. In the meantime, a push for its passage took several forms, including the creation of Asheville's own Young Men's White Supremacy Club. On June 27, 1900, the Asheville Daily Citizen reported on the organization's inaugural meeting held the previous night. Among its speakers was a Dr. Paquin, according to the paper. It says that Dr. Paquin declared that the amendment ought to be carried in such a way as will convince the people of the North that the question was of supremacy of the white man and not a partisan one. He declared that it was ridiculous and absurd to give the Negro or any other debased race political equity with the Anglo-Saxon. Mr. Paquin's speech pleased the club so much that it was resolved to ask him to write out his views for publication. So they had a procession. They went out on the streets. They had a torchlight procession, tiki torch. They went out in the streets of downtown Asheville and 1,200 to 1,500 people. They were like a parade of spectators, old men and boys, ladies and children, full of enthusiasm. And they, they, they uh, shouted until they became hoarse. Some of the things that they said was all coons look alike. I'm sorry. All coons look alike to us. Give white supremacy a thousand in Bun Cumby. White supremacy is life. Black supremacy is death. So these are some of the things. This is the history. Now, getting back to the question, right? Let's get back to that question. When I asked about Asheville being a sundown town. Well, we know that things change, uh, attitudes change, but everybody has their own experiences. So we can't say, like I said earlier, we could never know if a place officially on record is a sundown town. We can only know from the records, uh, I'm sorry, from the experiences of people. That's the only way we will actually know about places is if, if we get an actual account, something tangible, real evidence. So we'll never know if Asheville, North Carolina is one of those places, but we do know the history of Asheville, North Carolina. And let me just pull up was projected in 24 to have 96,000, the population. In 2023, I believe it was 95, okay, 95,000. Race and ethnicity. The largest Asheville race ethnic group are white. That's 78.4%, followed by black people who are 10.4% and Hispanic 6.2%. Now, once again, going back to what I was saying, we will never know if it's one of those places, but this was one of those places that brothers and sisters uh, are speaking about on social media that was a sundown town that was destroyed virtually by Hurricane Helene. Now, can we say it? No, we can't. But the history shows you what the foundations of that place was. 